This is Mark Fletcher, and welcome to my world. Welcome to Southern Tales, Tall and Otherwise. Before I joined a fraternity, I thought that they were rich kids who had to buy friends. I thought that they were a refuge for the oddballs and blue bloods of society. I thought that they were the soft and probably weak. But then I discovered that at Memphis State, there were a couple of working class fraternities places where guys from the sticks like me, who may or may not be socially inept, could meet new people and in some cases thrive. And of course, our fraternity thought that Animal House was our Bible and the way things should be. Yep, like I say, it's just a Southern thing. Sit back and enjoy. Southern Tales, Season 2, Episode 9, Animal House in Memphis. Now, you must remember it's like 1980 or so, and we didn't have the information we have now. Cable TV was pretty new, and there really weren't many channels. MTV wasn't there yet, there was no CNN. Listen, we had very little information to go on. We just did what we did and figured that as long as we got away with it, eh, it was probably okay. Looking back, everything was definitely not okay. And this is where we are off to tonight. And while there may be some disputes about the actual facts, this is the way that I remember it. And in my opinion, every goddamn word is true. Hey, I do want to jump in real quick and mention that our Season 2 theme music is from Audra Brown. Now, she has several records or CDs, whatever you call them these days, maybe downloads. But you can get her music at bandcamp.com or at cdbaby.com. This song is called Nitro, and it is from her record called The Cody Sessions. She's been described as a mixture of Kurt Cobain and Joan Jett, and we think that's pretty damn cool. Support her and music. And again, welcome to the Southern Tales Podcast. Tonight, as I said, we're going back to 1980. We're going to tell a few more fraternity stories, including one of the wilder things ever to happen on the Memphis State campus. If you've not listened to previous episodes, I'd strongly advise it. Eh, you'll listen, understand a little bit more, have more perspective about tonight's show, and you'll also know some of the characters that you hear about again tonight. I think it'll make it more fun and meaningful, but if you don't, what the hell. So, as mentioned previously... Our fraternity had been severely wiped out by a night of lust that they had had the spring before I pledged. Can you imagine that? A lot of the fun guys were gone, perhaps thankfully, but that left the rest of us to figure out what to do and where to go. The first president of the fraternity from my pledge class was a guy named Deej. He was a really good guy, and the, the fact is he was probably too good a guy to be in our fraternity. Um, 
Deej had high hopes of recreating our image as his own. He wanted to return us to the days of the gentleman's fraternity. You know, a group of Christian men bound together by the good book. Kind of like what I heard in second grade. You know, Jesus was going to be a member. Um, yeah, but that'd be more like a social club, right? How much fun would it be if Jesus was always at the party, right? So the first rush for a membership, Deej had a great idea. He said, listen, we got to find a way to stand out from all the other fraternities who are nothing but a bunch of heathens, right? So he said, listen, we're, we're going to um, uh, stand out, and when these prospective members visit, um, they'll remember us. We're going to get a keg, right? Everybody's got kegs, except we're going to fill ours with milk. We're going to bake cookies, and that will really separate us. Now, that seemed a bit off to my roommate Shane and myself. You see, we lived in a room that we called the Pleasure Palace. I'm not sure anybody else called it the Pleasure Palace, but we were having a good time anyway. So, Rush came and went, and we were unique and different. And while most fraternities signed 20 or 30 new members, we signed one. Exactly one. And he was a milk and cookies kind of guy, not an Animal House kind of guy. And, but really, it didn't bother Shane and I. We continued on partying and having a big time. And not long after that, at a fraternity meeting, Deej pontificated from the pulpit about the awful stuff going on in the Pleasure Palace. Now, he didn't call it the Pleasure Palace. He called it y'all's room. But he said something like, if the rest of campus knew what was going on in y'all's room, and suddenly Shane stood up and finished his sentence. If the rest of campus knew what was going on in our room, we would be the biggest fraternity on campus. Unbelievably, most of the guys cheered. And just like that, we were in. The next election, I became president and Shane treasurer. We controlled everything. Our first rush, we had kegs and kegs of beer and Garibaldi's pizza delivered every 15 minutes. We signed 25 great new guys. The party was about to begin. And... And the wildness started immediately. The neighbors were constantly calling the cops on us because we were too loud or parked too many cars on the street or drinking in the front yard. Maybe we were peeing in the front yard. Certainly we were puking in the front yard. It was complete madness. And, and this party atmosphere, well, it attracted some weird dudes too. One guy was a fraternity alumni named Ed. He was in his late 30s, maybe even early 40s. I mean, when you're 20, everybody seems old and ancient, right? But Ed was a Memphis cop, and he still lived with his mom out on Cottingham near Germantown. Ed was creepy, but we couldn't stop alumni from coming around. It was like, you know, they'd pay their dues, and they were alumni. But there were some cool alumni who came by every now and then. But really and truly, most guys, you get out of fraternity, you move on with your life. But this guy was the weirdest. One Saturday night during a party, oh yeah, I'd slipped upstairs with a high school girl named Britt. But she wanted to be called Cassie for some odd reason. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Britt or Cassie. Or, so through the window, she noticed a bunch of blue lights outside. I mean, I looked up and the sky was blue with flashing, blinking, blaring red lights, uh, blue lights right at our house. So um, she asked me if I was going to go down since I was president. I looked out the window. Uh, yeah, I said, I said, um, no, we, we better stay here. <laughs> so, but here's what happened. This weird alumni, Ed, was at the party and he was always chasing young girls, but no one wanted to be near him because he was weird. He would always get super drunk and this night was no different. He stumbled outside and he was smarting off to some dudes who did not even belong to our fraternity. Anyway, I guess he went too far, and one of the guys beat the shit out of him. I mean, literally beat him fierce. Well, oh Ed, he crawled to his car, where fortunately he had his police radio. He jumped on the police radio and screamed, Officer Down, at our address on Spotswood. If you know anything about police... That is the one phrase that will get every cop in town there in five seconds. Uh-huh. 
All these cops are there. They're cracking heads and trying to figure out what happened. It kind of ruined the party, right? All these cops are there and everything. But as it turned out, the next week there was an investigation. And poor Ed got suspended without pay for two weeks. Basically for being a dumbass. You know, stupid shit like that was always happening. You know, for a while we had a drug problem. I mean, guys walked around the house smoking pot like maybe it was legal or something. One Sunday at meeting, I told the guys that smoking pot or other drugs were illegal on our property and we couldn't do it anymore. Many were disappointed, but, you know, they figured there was some madness behind my message or message behind my madness. Anyway, after the meeting, Shane and I went upstairs to Pleasure Palace and we were talking about how the guys responded while we were toking on our bong. <laughs> yeah, that was a Pleasure Palace. Our, our toga parties were legendary. They would attract people from all over town, other colleges, other fraternities, all the wild girls, all the wild guys. It was spectacular in its atrociousness. Before the party, we would send the pledges to get the ingredients for our PGA punch. And if you ever want to know how to make it, here it is. So you get a couple of huge garbage, garbage cans, you know, big plastic Rubbermaid kind. You fill each halfway with PGA. That's pure grain alcohol, 160 proof, which means 80% alcohol. And then you add in all sorts of cut up fruits like lemons and limes and oranges, a few cherries and a bunch of Sprite and lemonade. Then you stir and stir and stir. One evening, I was walking through as they stirred with a black baseball bat. I said, hey, let me try. The pledge took the bat out of the punch. Only the handle was still black. You see... The rest of the black varnish on the bat had been ate up by the punch. We looked at each other, and being the leader I was, I took a styrofoam cup and dipped it in. I drank it and pronounced it as being ready. I told him to throw the bat away before somebody saw it. (laughs) And, And wild stuff happened at toga parties. There was a girl I went to high school with. Um, She'd broken up with a longtime boyfriend and was ready to party. Now remember, this is one of the girls who would not even talk to me in high school. Of course, most of the girls from my high school wouldn't talk to me. But, but anyway, she was at the party, and I'd seen her several times during the night. Sometime after midnight, she grabbed me and took me out back. And we sat on a picnic table, and she proceeded to kiss me like I'd never been kissed before. I mean, it was pretty shocking to me. I just kept trying to pinch myself. Anyway... She said, let's go back to my place as soon as possible. I said, oh my gosh. So we jumped in my car. As we crossed the railroad tracks, headed back toward campus, she told me to stop. I did, and she opened the door and proceeded to puke for about 10 minutes. She shut the door, and we rode on back to her dorm. I stopped out front, and she said, aren't you going to park and come in? I said, "Uh, no, baby. I, I never kiss chicks after they puke. She shut the door and went back to the party. I never saw her again. And if she even remembered kissing me, she must have been embarrassed because she knew I was one of those people she should never talk to. Yeah. Anyway, it's all true, I think. The same year, we'd signed a couple pledges who were ROTC guys, R-O-T-C. That meant they were Army dudes who were in college. And, And these guys, they were some sneaky shits always doing reconnaissance against other fraternities, using all those kind of, you know, army words, sneaking into other fraternity houses, stealing stuff. Then they would rig the houses with trip wires and stuff. I mean, they were always running around in camouflage. They had walkie-talkies, kind of G.I. Joe stuff. Yeah, I Kind of fun, right? Now, I, I never did it with them, but it was fun watching them, and they were exuberant. One day, I was drinking beer in the front yard. We were always drinking beer in the front yard. When uh, these guys pulled up all excited, they had just gotten back from RE, ROTC weekend, and they'd stolen some stuff. The big thing was a case of what they called grenade simulators. They were cardboard, r- white, round, baton-like objects with a pull cord, similar to what a real gr- grenade would look like. And these guys were more excited about them than I was because I just assumed it was like smoke bombs or something, right? No big deal. A few nights later, a rival fraternity, Pi Kappa Alpha, 
was having some sort of pledge swap. Now, the Pikes, as we called them, were preppy guys who always wore those shirts with alligators on them. We had banned those shirts at our house. But I think their name was Pat Crockett and Keith Wolf, I think. Anyway, these guys thought it might be fun to interrupt the pledge swap at the Pike House with a few grenade simulators. Now, Shay and I had no reason to be worried. But as they left the house, we thought we'd go outside and drink a beer, in the front yard, of course, just to see if we could hear or see anything. Now, the Pike House was across the tracks near the engineering building, maybe four, five city blocks away. We doubted we would hear anything. Then suddenly, we saw a flash of fire up into the sky, and right after we heard the sonic boom. We looked at one another. Could that be our boys? No, nah, no way. No way! Those little cardboard... Then from a distance, we heard the sirens of campus police and screeching tires. It appeared like the noise was getting closer to us. Shane looked at me and said, Surely those boys are smart enough not to come back here. Well, we looked to our left, and down Spotswood, we saw a car almost jump the hill by the P.E. building as he came towards us with three campus police cars in chase. They got near our drive, hit the brakes, and skidded into our driveway into the backyard. Campus police skidded to a stop and jumped out of their cars. I jumped up and told them, this is private property. But our goose was cooked. Not long after, I got a call from Dean Hampton, who was over Greek affairs, amongst other things. He knew me pretty well, and he was pissed. Apparently, the simulators had broken some windows, burned up some bushes in their front yard, and scared some of their little sisters. <laughs> now, he didn't give me a chance to respond, but he basically said, have your ass in my office at 9 a.m. Monday. We are going to put an end to you. Well, I didn't, didn't really like those words. Um, I sweated that all weekend. I mean... I could barely get drunk, I was so worried. I, I mean, I think I did, but it was difficult, and it, it doesn't matter. Monday came. I went up to University Center where Dean Hampton's office was, and his secretary, Wanda, told me to go down to the conference room. When I opened the door, I saw a firing squad, a table full of suits. Of course, there was Dean Hampton. But then there was Dean Carson, who was vice president of the university. He was like the number two guy. Teresa Lojour, she was head of Greek affairs and her assistant, the university's legal staff, and a few other suits I didn't, re didn't recognize. I mean, this was not a good situation. But, believe it or not, I was ready. I sat down, and they read the charges and described the crime scene. You would have thought, Hundreds were killed instead of just some little sisters got scared. After the charges were read, I jumped in before they had a chance to say anything. This is absolutely disgraceful. This is an attack on our American education system. This is an affront to all decent peoples. And I, for one, refuse to sit here and allow this type of action to occur. You know, as soon as we found out that two of our pledges had been involved in something of this nature, we excommunicated them immediately. We even took their pledge pins. We banned them from our property for life. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a Christian fraternity, and I demand action. They all looked at me like I was crazy. Then I said, I demand an investigation into the ROTC program that will allow dangerous weapons like this to get on the street. Imagine these weapons had fallen into terrorist hands. What would happen then? We must protect America. Dean Hampton's face got so red. I mean, I thought he was going to explode. And then he started to mumble. I could hear him. You little bastards. You're not getting away. And then Dean Carson cut him off. He said, Mark, you can leave. But if I ever see you or your fraternity in any negative way again, you're out. Dean Hampton's face continued to get redder and redder. 
and I'd seen it read a lot, but never this read. I stood up and said, thanks for protecting the American way of life and walked out. For the liner notes of this episode and all episodes of the Southern Tales podcast, please go to broadneckmusic.com where you'll find out more about the episode. You can also find more about our kick-ass theme music from Audra Brown, one of Memphis's best young songwriters. You can also contact me at stalespodcast at gmail.com. You can ask questions, hey, or you can tell me your stories, and eventually your stories can get on the Southern Tales podcast. Once again, Thanks for listening, and please tell a friend about the fun we're having. See you next week on Southern Tales, 20 Minutes and a Smile. (laughs) 